Welcome everyone to this webinar organized by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, or GAIN, in the run up to the UN Food Systems Summit and Nutrition for Growth. I'm Lana Wagena, a Brazilian and American youth leader active in Act for Food, Act for Change, a global initiative facilitated by GAIN, the Food Foundation, and the UN Food Systems Summit that aims to collect more than 1 million signatures in the run up to the Food Systems Summit and a pledge committing youth to healthy and sustainable diets while also holding all parties in our society, including governments, businesses, and civil society accountable to contributing significantly to defeating hunger, improving health, fighting climate change, and healing the planet. This initiative will be officially launched late April of this year and will trigger a decade of action definitely stay tuned. I'm also vice chair of Shifting to Sustainable Consumption for the UN Food Systems Summit. And today I'm delighted to be moderating this fourth episode of GAIN's Interview Cruncher. For the next hour, we will examine the role of women entrepreneurs in the food system from Mozambique, Nigeria, and Pakistan. On Monday, the 8th of March, we celebrated International Women's Day. Aligning with that, if we persist and choose to challenge, we can make meaningful food systems transformations together. Against the backdrop of this significant year for nutrition and food, I will ask our panelists on how they meet the challenges in their context and what are the things they want changed for women to thrive everywhere. We have joining us today as our panelists, Udwak Igbeka, Africa Manager of the Scaling Up Nutrition or Sun Business Network, Farah Naz, Gain Country Director of Pakistan, and Zareen Haddad, Social Impact and Donor Liaison at Chikwa Fish Farm. I've mentioned some of the topics on which we will be inviting questions from our speakers, and we'll also be inviting questions from you and the audience as well. Please put any questions you have in our social channels, and we'll try to get through as many of them as possible. First, we will be hearing from Zareen Haddad. After transitioning out of conflict and humanitarian settings, Zareen has recently joined Chikwa Fish Farm in Mozambique and is responsible for expanding and strengthening their social impact initiatives. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Zareen Haddad from Chikoa Fish Farm. Um, I'm here in Maputo, um, but Chikoa Fish Farm is located in a very remote area of Mozambique in Tet province. Um, I'm going to show some pictures just now to give you a sense of the context of what the farm is like. As you can see, it's that's during the dry season. Um, it's incredibly hot. Temperatures go well into the 40s and there's very low rainfall in the dry season. That road that you see on that peninsula is a road that was dug by hand by uh, employees of Chikoa. We have to grow our own vegetables for all the staff on the farm as the area is very arid. Um, this photo is of our nursery um, and you can see we are doing, um, an in, we've taken an innovative approach to uh, breeding in the lake um, and all our nursery of the spires there. This is the radical transformation you have from dry season to wet season. That's the same peninsula that you saw earlier. Um, but as you can see, very remote, not a lot of development. Um, I included this photo because it just sort of showed as a woman walking back to the village where she comes from with water on her head because women have to travel fast distant, vast distances to collect water that's uh, drinkable water um, and not uh, contaminated. Um, so that's just a bit of the context of Chikoa uh, where we are situated. Um, we are Mozambique's number one commercial tilapia producer. It's a very nascent industry. Um, historically, Mozambique is much more known for prawn aquaculture. Um, and tilapia is just beginning to gain some traction and the government has also prioritized the aquaculture value chain as a priority sector moving forward over the next 10 years and more. 
So there's really a lot of um, initiatives and projects that are being undertaken now, both nationally and within the private sector in Mozambique. And so I think it's, um, I'm very grateful to this opportunity to discuss that a little bit here with Gain. Um, and yeah, specifically around the ways in which we can be more inclusive of women within this value chain that is traditionally predominantly a male dominated sector. Thank you, Zareen. Um, so we can see that your work in Mozambique includes some concepts of community engagement, gender empowerment, expanding sustainable practices, and also striving to meet Mozambique's protein demands through a sustainable, inclusive business model. My question to you is on the myth that women's role is minor in the food supply chain from farming to processing and from producing to markets. How can we debunk such an argument? Um, I think, so I've just said that it's a predominantly male uh, industry, but there are many um, activities that women are already engaged in and are traditionally engaged in, in relation to other uh, value chains. So one of the most important ways in which women can be included is through um, distribution, like sales and distribution. And what we typically see in Mozambique is that women vendors are the main the main people who are taking products to markets, um, especially in provincial areas or rural areas. Pre-COVID, there was a lot of cross-border trading, and that was also predominantly women that were doing that. And they were doing that with fish as well, but normally that was fish that was wild capture fish. Whereas what we're hoping to do is through having like sustainable fish farms, then you are ensuring that supply because the conditions, especially in that part of Mozambique, basically ensure a perennial supply of fish. And also that reduces pressure off of marine fishing, which is unfortunately it's been depleted in Mozambique and stocks are very low. So we see that there's these roles women can take up, but not necessarily that they have to take it up because they're already in those positions. But then obviously there are more areas of the value chain where we have to be intentional about bringing women in. And that's definitely around the production of fish. Um, and then um, in terms of the sales and like becoming the managers or owners of small to medium enterprises. So that's where we have to definitely put more concerted effort to be sure women come in. But they're already operating within distribution, informal networks, trading networks, and then also Lessons learned in Zimbabwe and Zambia indicate that women normally enter the value chain in quite strong numbers when you have processing. So when processing factories are established, um, that's where women tend to, you see an increase in women working there. And so it's, I think it's also just about the industry having an understanding of where are the quick wins we can have where women already are act active and how can we further capacitate them? Um, and then also where are the gaps and what do we need to do to overcome those? Um, yeah. Thank you, Zareen. I think that's very important to understand the work that women are currently doing and the roles that are already being played. So in the time being, uh, while we still have these patriarchal norms and traditional gender roles, are there a way to use hmm. that to our advantage in food systems and while we are still transitioning towards more equitable communities? Um, yes, I would say definitely. I think I've learned a lot being in Mozambique about not necessarily always fighting um, the change and also sort of like, how do you work with what you have? Um, and I've had very fruitful conversations with women who've basically said, look, we're not interested in that part. That's not where we feel comfortable. That's not what we want to do. And I think it's important to also hear women when they say that and basically be like, okay, well, what part of the business are you interested in? And again, that is from the engagement that I've done with the community that's in that area where Chikoa Fish Farm is. Um, it's very clear women want to actually be running the operation so they want to actually be in positions of ownership um, and then they also are like look we're really good at 
the tasks around the nursery, for example, but and like rearing the fish in that very early stage. But once they pass on to the production, we don't, we're not that interested necessarily. And then also a lot through like distribution channels. Women want to be there. They understand markets. They understand consumption, how women are purchasing. And so they sort of have an innate know-how around that. Um, and so I think that's also taking what we would see normally as, oh, women are domestic or the primary caregivers. And yes, they are. But then how do you actually bring all of that experience and knowledge into a uh, private sector or any or even a smallholder development project and capitalize on it? Everyone's benefit. Um, yeah, I mean, what that's here yeah, that Mika is a very remote rural area. And as you move around the country, because it's a huge country, um, you encounter very different realities in other provinces. And so it's also about being sensitive to what you are experiencing up on the farm in Tech province is maybe not the same situation somewhere in a different province that has maybe a greater concentration of wealth or socioeconomic activities. And so it's really also just about understanding broadly speaking, but then also being able to hone in on your specific area and then either address that issue there, but then how much of it is, can you create linkages to the sector as a whole or the industry? Um, and feed that into private sector and other actors. Thank you, Zareen, for these insights. I agree it's always very important to consult women locally and seeing what they want to do um, and how to make the most of that and achieve the empowerment to make that happen. So thank you so much for your addition. Now we'll be moving on to our next speaker, Farah Naz, who is GAINS Country Director in Pakistan. She's trained in rural development and gender with 30 years of experience working in the development sector with national and international NGOs and UNDP in Pakistan, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Philippines, and Guinea. Welcome, Farah. Go ahead. Farah, make sure that you're unmuted. Thank you. In Pakistan, actually, there are only 1% businesses that are owned by women. And this is not the food businesses. This is all kinds of businesses. So this is the environment in which, I mean, almost all men owning the businesses, running the businesses. There, there uh, may be um, businesses that women are doing. Most of them are informal, uh, not registered very, very small micro scale, I would say, and um, not actually, in fact, in Pakistan, uh, there has been a lot of commitment by the government to nutrition. And there is a uh, vision 2025. Uh, and aligned with that, there is a multi-sectoral nutrition strategy as well. However, it's um, how it benefits uh, women and uh, women entrepreneurs. Um, it, it is not really, there is one out of eight objectives. There is one objective which is focused on business engagement, technical, uh, uh, technical know-how and technical support to the businesses that are involved in food, uh, food manufacturing. Uh, however, it, it's not on promoting women-owned uh, businesses. Um, However, there are other programs within the government which have been focusing within the government also run by other international NGOs, donors, uh, various international development actors that focus on promoting women enterprises. 
and there has been uh, a lot of training done for women and women who wanted to start their businesses there has been skill training there has been business management training and and a lot has been done there are uh, programs which provide uh, small scale loans also for uh, various enterprises uh, but that's that's kind of general so if you look at the situation in pakistan it's not the specifically promoting food businesses owned by women is hasn't been the focus so far far first as we are under covid-19 the global productions on the impacts of the pandemic on nutrition of children and mothers are grim as per the standing together for nutrition consortium findings but projections are not destiny right the nutrition year of action is an opportunity to rebuild and recommit nutrition promises to children and mothers in early december last year pakistan was immensely praised for its 2.18 billion commitment to address malnutrition and stunting by 2025 which health and family welfare minister Saheed Malik said at the kickoff of the nutrition for growth year of action will help ensure that the country's rates of malnutrition continue to decline an ongoing trend since 2015 my question for you is how do you think women entrepreneurs could seize this opportunity to shine their light in standing up for women and girls and breaking that grim cycle of malnourishment go ahead far definitely um, this program that government is uh, running at the moment it includes social um, social protection program where there are uh, cash grants for uh, women and for young uh, for adolescent girls um, those are linked with the school a uh, school uh, nutrition program or school education so that you know the girls can continue their education their nutrition is supplemented as well as the micronutrient um, uh deficiency is addressed in schools also for mothers through through the mother and child health program there there is there are lots of interventions which will be focusing on micronutrient deficiency uh like for example anemia and other deficiencies but but at the same time if we talk about opportunities for uh, for uh, enterprises of women um i do not think that it specifically brings about any uh, additional opportunities for women however during covid what has happened is that it has in fact negatively affected uh, women owned enterprises and some of the enterprises which were in the informal sector not registered are almost uh, are closed down and there is uh, with some of them at least half of them there is no uh at, at least at the moment there is no uh, um, no future in sight in uh, sight for them that uh, that they will be able to reestablish their business because the place where they were operating is taken away or uh, whatever uh, other resources they had uh, have been spent on the family survival so some of these things have also happened there is this program which is addressing covid related uh, uh, covid related mal- malnutrition and there is a lot of food distribution uh, that happened through the social protection program as well as other ngos and other development actors have also taken part in that uh, but in terms of enterprises the situation remains a little grim Thank you, you. Far. That is certainly an important impact to understand and thank you for your insights. We're also wondering about in the food sector, what are the latest developments regarding women-owned enterprises in Pakistan? Yeah, actually most of the women-owned enterprises in food sector are informal and many of those are actually managed from home. uh so so with the with the technology uh, technology development there are now opportunities for women who are uh, actually taking online orders and serving uh, serving various population in terms of delivering the food however this is there is um, uh, it, 
these are still very limited. They have very limited business. And uh, it's the business usually, we have to see that for women, the business uh, is not usually based on their aspirations. Very small number of women in Pakistan aspire to do their businesses. The, most of the women who do these businesses, they kind of, they are forced into this situation where there, there was a family emergency, they lost the breadwinner of the family and they started something where they did not need training and with little capital, they could start a small business which will at least, you know, continue the survival of the family. So for, for them, this, is, this was not by choice. Uh, however, uh, now that they are in this business, they still face a lot of uh, challenges in terms of growing that business because um, for them, taking it to scale becomes a big issue. And that uh, actually, um, the challenges that they face are related to social, um, mostly people's behaviors and attitude towards, towards women, uh, working women, and especially in the business sector, uh, very negative attitudes. Similarly, if you look at the capital, capital is not easily available. If you are not registered, you cannot access uh, capital. Similarly, if you're not registered, you will not get the technical assistance from any government bodies because you have to be registered. For women, lack of knowledge about uh, how to get registered, legal assistance, uh, lack of legal assistance, that actually keeps them uh, actually far behind than their men counterparts. So this is basically the situation of uh, uh, food, uh, food related um, uh, the ones who have registered businesses, they are now they have kind of recovered after after the lock, lockdown was over. They have kind of recovered from that shock and they are back into work. But those most of the women who are not uh, women owned businesses, which are not registered, they are still struggling. Thank you, Farah. I think those are really important barriers to understand when we're looking at women entrepreneurs and women in food. So thank you for your great addition. Now we're going on to our last speaker, Udwak Igbeka. She has been with Gain in Nigeria for the past 10 years, working across large scale food fortification, home fortification, promotion of biofortified crops, social behavior change communication, and a wide spectrum of public-private engagements in nutrition. She's African Manager for the Scaling Up Nutrition, or Sun Business Network, SBN, a network co-convened by GAIN and the UN World Food Program, or WFP. Welcome, Udwak. Go ahead. Thank you, Lana. Yes, so um, what I want to highlight uh, women within the food systems in Nigeria who are doing things that are really inspirational um, and also doing things that are putting foods, Nigerian foods on the global um, market. So I want to start with a 2020 Sun Pitch Competition winner. Her name is Shewu Shongoleye. She's the mom in chief at a company called Baby Grubs. Uh, Shewu is a very resilient businesswoman and um, entrepreneur who has started this business born out of the need to provide homegrown solutions to complementary feeding in Nigeria. Most of our stunting statistics exist within that um, age group of uh, children who are transitioning from exclusive breastfeeding to complementary feeding because it's really difficult for mothers to find convenient foods uh, to feed babies with that are nutritious. And so she started this business and also has a very interesting business module where she works with women at the community level, um, providing them with products on credit that ensures that they are able to um, sell at the community level and make some profit for themselves. So protecting the livelihoods of mothers uh, within low-income households and ensuring that their children as well 
have access to safe and nutritious foods. Um, Shemu participated in the 2020 uh, pitch competition, pitch competition and emerged as the global winner and is currently receiving technical assistance to further improve the nutritional benefits of her products and to further expand the footprint of her distribution across the continent. She's already in, in quite a few um, African countries already. Now, also, you can't talk about food and nutrition in Nigeria without uh, talking about Ndidi Ngunelli, who is the co-founder of a company called AACE Ace Foods, AACE Foods in Nigeria. Now, Ndidi's business is, is one that is built strongly on connectivity with smallholder farmers. Um, she's ensured that throughout the value chain of her production process, smallholder farmers are involved end to end. She has um, developed uh, cost-effective nutritious foods that have been used widely in development programs to address stunting, uh, wasting, and, um, and moderately acute malnutrition in various parts of Nigeria. She has also ensured that um, she has developed a team structure where um, members of her team uh, buy into her business and into her vision. Her linkages with the smallholder farmers ensures that she's able to offtake from them. Um, she's able to build their capacity to uh, implement some backward integration programs with those smallholder farmers to protect their livelihoods as well. Uh, I think we've I've talked about uh, different sizes of businesses, uh, Baby Groves, which is an emerging business, um, Ace Foods, which is a, a medium sized company. I, I can also talk about a, a, a moderately uh, large company uh, run by Uju Uzo Ojinaka. Uju is the CEO of um, a Pan-African company called Traders of Africa. We just started this company because she realized that there was a gap in the market. Um, on the continent, sourcing for Nigerian grown foods was very difficult. Uh, there's so many trust issues, there, there are logistic issues between um, those who are demanding this agricultural produce and those who have this agricultural produce. And then in between, there wasn't a strong platform where trade could take place. And so uh, Uju decided that innovation could help in bridging this gap. Uh, she's able to create a market connectivity linkages using technology where she's created this trading hub where essentially buyers could meet um, suppliers and the middleman that takes away all the, um, the most of the profits from the smallholder farmers can be uh, eliminated. This ensures that nutritious foods are able to get from the hands of the farmers who are producing them to those um, food processors around the continent who are actively looking and trying to source for these products. So Uju has used technology uh, to scale up the access to safe, nutritious foods. Uh, there are smaller or much smaller businesses that are doing things within their community that are increasingly very interesting, especially in these days of COVID where businesses have needed to pivot quite significantly for them to be able to ride out the pandemic. Uh, one of the members of the Sun Business Network in Nigeria, uh, Super Kitchen, is run by a lady called Ife Olua. Uh, Ife runs a company that, uh, is, that deals predominantly on, on fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, during the pandemic, it was difficult to move around and um, for, for customers to come to the business. And so if I had to think about ways that she could still get her produce into the hands of her, of her, of her customers. And uh, she has customers that are from very low income households. Uh, and for, for her to continue to service them, she came up with um, a USSD short code uh, where you can uh, use a phone that's not smart to place an order for um, fresh fruits and vegetables that she off takes from local farmers. So these are some of the women that are doing things that are very interesting um, within the food systems in Nigeria. Thank you, Uruak, for these very inspiring examples. Each of these businesswomen in her own unique way, I would say, is well representing Nigeria at home or around the world. And as we know, Nigeria is one of the leading economies in Africa right now and an exciting 
place to be a woman entrepreneur. So thank you for these stories of some of the inspirational women entrepreneurs who are changing the face of food business in your country and also around the world, getting their products they're creating and their business models noticed. Also, Udok, how do you think women entrepreneurs differ from their male counterparts within food systems? And how do you think that we can get more women in the driving seat to help improve the food system's ability to deliver on nutritious foods? Thank you, Lana. Uh, how do women differ from their male counterparts in the food systems? I think from what I've seen, women entrepreneurs uh, gravitate naturally towards other women. You empower one woman and uh, she has a tendency to empower so many other women, tens and hundreds of other women. You find that women entrepreneurs are always looking to create networks of women around them to ensure that um, what they are doing has an impact in the lives of other women. And, and this has a very strong impact on the nutritional benefits that end up in the household, especially for young children. Um, when you empower a woman, uh, what she does is uh, the, those benefits always ensures that the initial needs of the, the children, the elderly in the household are all well catered for. Um, how else do women differ from their male counterparts? I think their challenges are also different. Um, the things that the, the challenges that women face in the course of doing business are very different. Women have other responsibilities, um, child care, looking after the home. And so that makes it even that much more difficult for women to um, have the time to grow and nurture a business. And so when you see a successful woman, you can only imagine all the challenges she's been through. Uh, it pales in, com what, what, what men experience most of the time pales in comparison to what women experience in, in trying to grow a business. Um, also, you find that uh, the cultural gender roles affect how, how the kind of businesses that a woman can either undertake in some in some instances or um, what kind of interactions they can have even in trying to implement those businesses uh, in some parts of the country you will find that um, access to finance access to technical assistance really differs between men and women uh, in the financial institutions, most of the people making those key decisions are men. Uh, they are more inclined to give financial support to other men. But we are seeing a mindset change now. So many initiatives coming from the government, uh, from development partners, from private um, from the private sector themselves on trying to provide um, equitable access to those support mechanisms that ensure that women thrive within the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem. Thank you, Udwak. I think that is very enlightening to know and have a broader understanding of the context. As my last question to you, can you tell us about unique ways by which COVID has affected women entrepreneurs within the food system in your context in Nigeria? So we had several conversations with um, with businesses in general uh, and the impact of COVID. Um, and we find that when talking to women, uh, they have experienced the same impact as their male counterparts, the drop in sales, um, the, the drop in demand, depending on, on what line of business you're, you're, trading, you're trading in. Um, but you also find that because of everything that happened during the, um, the, the lockdowns, children having to be homeschooled, most of those responsibilities fell on, on women. And so in the recovery process, where um, there was some relax, relaxation of rules um, and, and restrictions on movement, women were not able to be as nibble as their male counterparts, especially in, in areas where uh, schools were still closed or you had um, family members who were sick or poorly and required care within the household. Most of those responsibilities fell on the women. And so women were not um, able to be as nibble as men in returning to the workplace um, until we, we saw schools reopening and, and other um, services 
resuming and being provided um, access to hospitals for people who were not well, uh, not necessarily with COVID, but with other ailments that were not given priorities in, in, in the thick of, of the pandemic. Um, but essentially, most of the experiences have been the same as far as business is concerned. Um, we also find that in, in being able to access support that is readily available in some, in some cases, it's not equitable because information is not accessed in an equitable way. Um, and so if we want to ensure that women feature uh, in more driving seats within the, the, the food system, we have to be more deliberate in the way we engage with women in our attempt to, in, to be inclusive, including women in our initiatives, in accessing finance, in, in accessing um, technical assistance, and really creating the opportunities for women to flourish within the food system. Thank you, Udwak. I know I learned a lot just hearing all of that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lana. Now we will be moving to the group discussion and questions which are open to all of our panelists. My first question open to the inputs of everyone. Uh, who is interested is what role do food systems and value chains play in promoting resilience in post-conflict settings or even post-COVID? Serene, go ahead. Hi, Lana, thanks. Um, yeah, I think there's an important correlation to be made between um, either post or a crisis setting, which is what we're seeing with COVID or in a post-conflict setting where societies in the state are still fairly fragile or are recovering from a conflict or a crisis or a catastrophe of some kind. And one of the first and the most important things that happens in any emergency response is food, like you need to secure food, right? That is, if people don't have food, they die. So I think there is, it's maybe not such an obvious link um, in the, like, from a bit of a bird's eye view, but really it is like, if you're building resilience and if you are strengthening food systems and value chains that are about providing nutrition to people, and you're also doing it at a very local level so that it's not only, for example, with the case of Jacoa, yes, we are a large commercial farm, but also we are committed to small scale farmer development as part of our social impact. And so how do you, ensure that that knowledge and those best practices and are passed along to other people who are the people who are normally the first communities to bear the brunt of any kind of crisis, such as COVID or in the case of Mozambique. Um, Mozambique has had Cyclone Idai in the last two years. There's tropical storms. There was another cyclone earlier this year. And so there's sort of almost like, when is the chance for communities to even recover? And how are we how are we helping them just always have that know-how and that ability to feed themselves as well as the larger communities around them, or for example, within a province or a certain geographical zone. Um, and I think it's a lot about equipping, it's passing on that knowledge, but it's also like recognizing that that's vital to people's survival and it's not only a livelihood um, as an, an income generating activity it's also like sustenance and if people are able to produce their own food for sale on one hand but also just to keep them going and then you can also include those people in any kind of emergency response that you have or with the example of um, what Udwak was saying about Nigeria and working with WFP you know, those are linkages that you can easily establish then between a uh, food system that's ongoing. And then when you need to link it with an international community when it comes to emergency responses as well. So I think there's often humanitarian and development um, actors, there is more and more overlapping, but often they operate in silos. And so I think we need to also think about how do we move out of that siloed approach and start to really see all those connections um, between different aspects of how people are living, um, depending on the global context and national context around them. Thank you very much, Serene. 
uh, Farah or Udwak, would you like yeah. to weigh in? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I would just like to add something. There is, a, there is this realization also amongst um, amongst the policymakers as well as the as well as other actors in the food system that uh, something that that uh, why food systems disrupt is the uh, is the disruption in the transport and disruption of mobility of people so so that is one of the thing that uh, that the policymakers now has had has to now started to discuss in pakistan that we need to promote um, um, urban um, uh, urban agriculture or urban food production um, and also aquaculture in the urban uh, urban center so that you know if there is uh, uh, there is that kind of a pressure in terms of transportation and all that uh, at least you know the the uh, the fresh food and uh, availability of that in the market would not uh, not become such such a massive issue as it became during the initial uh, very strong uh, lockdown that happened in various countries. Over. Thank you, Farah. Udwak, would you like to weigh in as well? Sure, Lana. Um, so I think it has, in, in many parts of the world, it has taken this pandemic for many governments to realize the importance of the food systems and the role that the food systems plays in um, supporting livelihoods. It's in, in ensuring that um, the economy stays moving as it were. Uh, and so we have come to realization that strengthening the food systems is really important in ensuring economical um, stability in, in our countries. Uh, and also that, um, we increasingly, increasingly need to look inwards within our, our um, immediate environment to see how we can to be more self-sustaining. Uh, border closures caused a lot of disruptions. Um, livelihoods were lost, lives were lost. And so I think now a lot of measures are being put in place to strengthen the, the food system so that the food system can continue to support all those or all the players that rely on it for um, for their livelihoods, for their sustenance, uh, and for their ability to um, participate in economic activities. So yeah, the food system plays a very strong role, um, and strengthening it would, would further build the resilience of um, of everyone that it affects. Thank you all for the wonderful, insightful responses to my question. Next, I want to move on to questions also from the audience who has been watching and uh, submitting. First up um, from the audience is in the run up to the Nutrition for Growth in Japan this December, how can women increase their weight and influence in decision-making towards a well-nourished children in our world? I think um, um, all, those, uh, all those actors who in one way or the other have responsibility of uh, consulting people and including them in the dialogue around food system uh, they also need, they have some responsibility in terms of ensuring that those voices reach uh, to, to these uh, forums where, uh, where usually the decisions are made and the commitments are made by, by different uh, state actors. So I personally think that uh, such kind of um, consultations and dialogues uh, need to happen at various different levels where uh, uh, where uh, women specifically are consulted, and women from all walks of life, not just the, not just those who are educated, who are in the urban uh, urban areas, but also uh, rural areas. Women who work uh, as unpaid labor on the farms. There are other uh, um, other vulnerable groups. So everybody is in order to get those voices included in this whole. Um, uh, whole dialogue up to up to these forums, UN Food Systems Summit, as well as the 
the nutrition for growth, uh, one needs to actually systematically help uh, bring in those voices because uh, people who are educated, they'll find uh, some way and people who have access to uh, to, to online systems and who can uh, actually add their, uh, at various um, online forums, add their opinion into that. But people who do not have access to these facilities or who are not educated, they will, they will not be able to bring in their voices. So specifically for them, there is a need for organizations working on nutrition, working on food system uh, to facilitate that and also to ask the governments, the state parties to actually facilitate those dialogues so that the voices are heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farah. Another question that we have from the audience is how we can help investors to also see the financial case for investment in nutrition. So I think we can um, create the platforms for invest investors to um, see the innovative ideas that are, are, are investable with and can also make an impact on nutrition. Uh, and also showcase those businesses that are doing things that are innovative and have wide impact across various populations. It's, um, and then it's really critical to build the capacity of those businesses to be investment ready and then package these businesses as investable um, as an investable pipeline and present them to the right investors and ensure that you're able to link what the businesses are doing the profitability of that business with the nutrition impact but creating those platforms where we can really make that connection and and bring everyone around the a shared understanding of what is required financially and what kind of impact can be made by this investment is really critical and this is what we try to do through the sun pitch competitions that happens across various countries um, across africa and asia thank you udwak i think this is a very important question would anyone else like to weigh in Sorry. yeah i would love to jump in on that one um i think what so from the position of Chikoa, we have had the, the privilege or the benefit of working a lot with impact investors. Um, and so it's you don't have to make a very hard sell to them around prioritizing nutrition. Like that is like that's not the difficulty that we have. People seem to understand that and recognize its importance. And but what we um, the struggle then is also for us, the challenge we find is um, there's a lot of hesitancy around um, investments in certain sectors. So aquaculture is not a popular sector to invest in mainly because like it requires, it's very capital intensive and takes a long time before you start to see um, profitability or any returns. Um, also, for example, in a country like Mozambique where there's the infrastructure around uh, tilapia aquaculture is quite underdeveloped. You really have to spend a lot of money laying out that infrastructure. and it's so capital intensive for a commercial farm, but it's as capital intensive for smaller farmers as well. And so, you know, there's sort of almost like to add what onto what Udwak said, it's around understanding the whole context around that investment. And then also understanding that it, with something like a fish farm, we need a lot of working capital to ensure, because whilst the fish are growing, nothing's Technically, nothing's happening, right? Like you're waiting for fish to grow until they're ready to harvest, but that is requiring a lot of working capital. And that's sort of like, that's not what donors want to fund necessarily. That's not what investors want to see their money go towards. And so, you know, you're sort of caught in this back and forth. And then the problem around that is all the companies, your overheads are basically, all your extra money that you have is just to cover salaries, which means you don't then have a lot of money for things such as, hiring external people to do some assessments or mapping or studies or look into the issues around nutrition and how what your product is addressing a nutrition or a protein deficit. And so you also then lose your capacity to do good advocacy and to sort of address those concerns. And so you get caught a bit in a catch-22. Um, and that's definitely something that is for donors and investors to sort of, you know, to 
to hear us when we say that to them, that this is where we're struggling and this is where we would need your assistance. Um, so, yeah, and that's part of, I mean, Chikora, we're quite frank with our, um, with people who are approaching us and in our community, we're very straightforward about that, but it obviously, you know, I think these conversations take time to actually result in actual shifts and tangible results. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Serene. It's always very insightful hearing specifically from your experiences and what has been happening at Tigua Fish Farm. Um, another question we have from the audience and the last question that we'll be looking at is, what are some of the strategies that have worked when looking at gender lens, investing for growth stage, women-led businesses in food systems? I, um, I would uh, talk from uh, Pakistan context. Uh, I think uh, what we need to do in Pakistan, one of the thing which is uh, related to the legal uh, businesses not being read, women led businesses not being registered and the uh, cumbersome process of registration or women not knowing these. Uh, so I, I think this uh, process need to be made easier for registration so that, you know, it's uh, it's easier for, for the women to be recognized then. Because right now, when I say that only 1% enterprises are owned by women, uh, um, I talk about the registered ones. So I'm not talking about the unregistered, informal, small uh, micro businesses, which are, uh, which are kind of here and there and not registered. So I'm not talking, that doesn't cover those businesses. So that is why in order to, to get them known and get them counted, there is a need for uh, for registration. Also, when you talk about uh, providing platforms for uh, promoting women-led businesses and promoting innovation that women can bring into, into the food sector, um, until now, the, although the platforms uh, for promoting innovation and platforms for promoting certain businesses, the startups and all that, they do exist, but none of those is kind of focused on uh, any nutrition related products. So, so probably one needs to have to do some advocacy with all these uh, various types of um, competitions that happen in the country, the expos that are held or uh, the startups where uh, the government supports the startups and, and uh, innovations uh, are funded and invest uh, and they do get investment or capital from various channels. I think we need to we need to sensitize or advocate with these bodies so that you know there is uh, some focus also on the nutrition related and women led uh, enterprises that can uh, bring to uh, that can bring women forward and that can also bring nutrition forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farah. I actually had one really good question last minute that um, was brought in from the audience, which is, do we see that women entrepreneurs are being exploited in any way, whether by businesses or intermediaries? And how can we mitigate that exploitation of women entrepreneurs? Udwak or Zareen, would you like to weigh in? I think we we see this a lot, especially with smallholder farmers, where um, you have middlemen coming in to uh, procure produce from smallholder farmers, and the pricing that they are offered to women is very different from the pricing that they would offer to their male counterparts. Um, and so this happens in not just for smallholder farmers, but across various value chains. Um, women are not being offered um, the same. Um, it's, it's, it's the same thing we're saying about equal pay. We're still struggling with equal pay at, at various levels, at the smallholder farmer level and um, across various institutions. So um, how, how, do we, how do we address that? Um, we find ways to ensure that there's um, some level of um, pricing regulation. Um, we eliminate those additional layers between 
uh, the supplier and the consumer or the market as much as possible to ensure that um, women get what they are due. And we try as much as possible to advocate for the elimination of cultural nuances that um, promote this kind of behavior. Uh, and so this is something that is very much still work in progress as, as, um, as a continent, as a country, we are still trying to see how we can um, uh, change this, this pattern of behavior. Thank you so much, Udwak. I think that is a very important topic to also bring in. And now as we are wrapping up, I would like to go around and in one minute only have a key takeaway or key action from each speaker. First, Serene, would you mind going ahead? Um, thanks, Lana. Um, I think my main takeaway or action is that um, listening to Udwak and Farah speak is just Sort of there's so many similarities and linkages that you can see and especially from the point of view of the sun uh, business network um because we have that in mozambique and there is one obviously in nigeria and i would definitely like to see closer sort of lessons learned or information sharing um even maybe some just like bilateral conversations continuing from this and the two networks connecting because i think i i mean what i'm hearing Adwak say is that especially in relation to aquaculture. Um, Nigeria just has like a lot of models that we could learn from um, as we're building out the aquaculture sector here in Mozambique. Thank you so much, Serene. Farah, could you go ahead? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is uh, again, once again, realizing that there are so many challenges that women face when they when they are exploring the unexplored. And it is not so unexplored now because day by day we have changed and we have seen uh, the difference in terms of visibility of women-owned businesses slowly and gradually. So personally, I feel that the challenges are still huge. Uh, however, uh, it is possible to overcome these challenges provided uh, the multi-sectoral response uh, and coordinated response is there by which is led by the by women in in various parts of uh, whether the government or the private sector but then they once they start asserting themselves only then the situation can change so i would say women's control need to be strengthened on their own uh, work that they do thank you thank you so much for our last but not least to Udwak. Thank you, Lana. I think what I would like to say is that um, we should be more deliberate in um, including women in um, in our in our in our programs, in our initiatives, and uh, we can't uh, design one size fits all solutions. We need to understand what specific challenges are faced by women, and and tailor support um, to be able to suit um, those challenges. Uh, when we talk about equity, it has to take into consideration or the enabling environment for equitable access to whatever support is being made available uh, such that women can benefit really, um, uh, 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 really and truly benefit from the support that is um, being made available for by through various mechanisms and, and platforms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Udwak. I agree 100%. And with that, I want to thank you all. It has been a privilege to learn about you and truly inspiring to hear your three strong voices. I hope our audience today has enjoyed this episode nearly as much as I've enjoyed hosting it. And following this episode, the recording will become available on GAIN's event page. I invite you to also join us in our next episode, which I am personally very excited about, on the Youth Pledge, Act for Food, Act for Change happening Thursday, the 22nd of April at 2 p.m. Central European time. Finally, wherever you are, mask up, social distance, wash your hands, and if available, take the vaccine to be safe. Thank you all.